Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Good morning. It's good to be here and worship today. Um, I'm wearing the mask today uh, just for now because I have an announcement to make. And my announcement is that on June the 7th, we will reconvene for worship at our services here. That's June the 7th. We will be observing um, precautions. Uh, seating will be different, uh, we'll be spaced apart. Uh, at least six feet apart, and we'll have a way of doing that. Um, you'll be asked to wear a mask when you come. Uh, bring a mask with you. Uh, if you don't have a mask, one will be provided here at the church. Um, and some of them will be homemade, like this one. And uh, if you get a homemade mask, you can take that home uh, and wash it and keep it for use. Um, but again, uh, worship will begin uh, June the 7th. Uh, the service at uh, 8.45, and then the service at 11.15. So God bless you, and we're looking forward to seeing you uh, June the 7th. Uh, we are encouraging those who are fragile, who, feel, um, who don't feel comfortable at all going out in public yet, or those who have very fragile health, we do encourage you to stay at home, and we will find ways, as time goes on, of ministering to you uh, at your home in some way. Um, but we have good news. We will be reconvening worship June the 7th. Welcome as we continue the Easter season. In a moment, we'll be doing the confession and hearing the word of forgiveness. We prepare our hearts together for worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You're invited to repeat these words after me as we confess. Almighty God, I have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed. By what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Forgive me, Lord. Renew me and lead me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It is always my honor and privilege to announce that the living Christ indeed forgives us and embraces us. We stand today, here and at home, as forgiven men and women, forgiven boys and girls. We are free in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as we continue the Easter season, we have this reading from John chapter 14. Jesus is in the midst of saying farewell to his closest associates and friends, his disciples. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. But Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, Believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, you might know the story about the poor cabin dweller who lived way out in the woods. And he had a cabin with an earthen floor. The floor was simply the ground. And that man decides to go out all over the country looking for buried treasure. And as I mentioned, he lives in an old cabin in the woods. And one day, this man is having his morning coffee right next to the old wood stove in his cabin. And the man suddenly decides to act upon a dream, a dream that he's nurtured all of his life. And so the man takes his faithful dog, a dog that he believes he's trained very well to search out buried treasure. And he takes that dog, he begins to travel all over the country in search of that buried treasure. And after about a year, a whole year of searching, the man finds nothing. Oh, he, he found a few buried coffee cans, a few concrete blocks. He found one old church's historical archives buried. 
And he found eight copies of Mad Magazine wrapped in plastic. But he decides that these almost worthless things, well, are just that. They're worthless to him. He's really found nothing. And so he begins to doubt that treasure-seeking dog and the dog's skills at finding treasure. The man finally gives up the whole thing. He goes home to his little cabin in the woods. And he's depressed, very depressed as he walks back into his cabin. And he says to himself, you know, I don't even have a real floor in this place. For as I mentioned, the cabin floor was simply the dirt of the earth. And the man lights the wood stove when he gets in there. He draws up a chair, he props up his feet, and he has a cup of coffee. But suddenly his dog, his dog begins sniffing around the wood stove. And the next morning the man has seen this and the dog has been pawing, pawing at the earth. And the man decides to start digging there in the earth right next to the wood stove. And just about two feet down, his shovel strikes something. It's an old metal box. And that box is filled with precious jewels. And this man is an overnight millionaire. So as the story goes, he gets his dog an air-conditioned doghouse and a lifetime supply of grain-free biscuits. Now you probably figured this story out when I started it. It's a pretty common story, right? He goes off looking for treasure, and when he gets home, he finds one under his own stove, And that's the real point of telling you the story today. This man did not have to go all the way around the country looking for treasure, for the treasure was literally at his home, right under his feet, and right under his own dog's nose. And so today in John's Gospel, Thomas and Philip, They throw a monkey wrench into an otherwise pleasant sermon that Jesus gives. And I wonder today, when Jesus is giving this very pleasant promise about the Father's house that has many dwellings, you will be with me, I wonder how Jesus felt. He shares that good news and that comforting promise. Let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many dwellings. I go to prepare your place. And I'm coming back. I'm coming back to take you there. It kind of reminds me of a very pleasant commercial that I've heard on the radio. Maybe you've heard it. It's a a commercial for the Motel 6. Motel 6. And there's a guy who says his name is Tom Bodette. And at the end of the commercial, there's this sort of pleasant music. And at the end of the commercial, Tom Bodette says, We'll leave the light on for you. We'll leave the light on for you. But seriously, you know, Jesus gives these great words of comfort. But Thomas and Philip, they spoil the mood. Thomas says, Now Jesus, you talk about the way or the road, but we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus responds to Thomas by saying, I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the road. 
Well, that puts the fire out that Thomas started. But now Philip, Philip starts another fire with his question. Jesus, you speak of the Father. You speak of God. Show me. I mean, Jesus, I'm from Missouri, you know. The show me state. Show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Thomas and Philip are both searching. Both are looking for God. Thomas and Philip are like you and me. They are deeply, passionately searching for ultimate meaning and purpose in life. They are looking for that treasure that we call God. But why is it? Why is it? Why is it we always think that what we are looking for is somewhere way off in the distance? You know, in the 1990s, I bought a poster which had a huge photograph of the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy in which we live. And they, the poster was sort of treated like it was at, at the mall, you know, where you see that little note that says, you are here, you are here, and then over here is a department store, over here is a restaurant, right? Well, on this poster, there's this photograph of the Milky Way galaxy. And at the bottom of the poster, it says, you are here, and then at the top of the poster, way on the other side of the Milky Way, it says, and all the cool stuff is here. All the cool stuff is here. The humor being, all the good things are billions of light years away from you. You know, we often assume that what we are looking for is far away somehow. Now Jesus speaks to both Thomas and to Philip. And he says, I am the road, I am the road, the way that you're looking for. If you have seen me, you have seen God. The treasure that you seek is right here in front of you. Now Philip has interrupted, of course, a perfectly good lecture by Jesus. Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And of course Jesus responds, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How did those very first disciples miss the truth, the road to heaven, and the presence of God, which was right there under their noses? You know, I think, first of all, we make the mistake. A mistake when we assume that we have not missed it. Right? We read these stories and we think, gee, how could uh, those early disciples be so very dense? But we miss the truth, too, when we assume that our vision is any better than the vision of disciples like Thomas and Philip. I mean, I wear modern eyeglasses for my eye problem, my nearsightedness. But my sight is really no better than the vision of those first century disciples. Especially, of course, when it comes to my spiritual vision. I don't blame Thomas or Philip today. We can't chastise or criticize the man who didn't know that treasure was hidden underneath his wood stove at home. 
We can't chastise or criticize him. After all, it was buried. It was a hidden treasure. It was not obvious to the naked eye. And in the same way, if we were to see God with our naked eyes, we would be overwhelmed. We wouldn't know what in the world we were looking at. And you might remember some of those stories in the Old Testament where people are actually spared from having to look directly at God. Moses is one of those. God comes so often in the Old Testament wrapped in clouds and fog and veils. Veil is placed over the face of Moses. Because even from looking at God, we are told, Moses' face was shining so brightly that others couldn't even look upon Moses. Martin Luther often spoke about the hidden God. The hidden God. He said, God comes hidden in Jesus. God comes hidden in Jesus. In human flesh, God comes hidden in the cross. And that's the whole purpose of Christmas, by the way. God born in ordinary human flesh that you don't even really recognize as God. We confess that Jesus Christ, our Lord, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, he died, and he was buried just like anyone else. And if that is not a picture of hidden treasure, then I don't know what is. And yet, to see Jesus is to see God. To experience God in a broken, sinful, and frail community like the Christian church, that is to see God. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So Jesus answers the questions of Thomas and Philip. When you see my mortal flesh, you see God. When you hear human words, even words that have been printed or etched on parchment, you're hearing God. When you experience a community of broken people who dare to proclaim that Christ is risen, and that we are forgiven. There, you're seeing God. And when we hear God's word, and we are alone and afraid, as many of us have been and felt during these last few months, the hearing of God's word is still a vision of God, even through all the brokenness when we gather with the mask over our nose and our mouth, and we hear God's word and we pray, we see God. Wherever we hear the promise of Christ spoken over the wafer or the regular household bread, we are seeing God. The great good news, the best news in the world is this. You don't have to go off looking for God in the distance. God is not off somewhere over the rainbow. Jesus said to Philip, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. 
The treasure is a hidden treasure. But you know, Jesus, Jesus has already given us a great gift, and that's why we have books like John's Gospel. Jesus has already told you and me where to look. He's told us where to look. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, we have the opportunity of confessing our Christian faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You may repeat after me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Loving God, we often complain that we want more light. We want more certainty as we define certainty. Lord, help us realize the problem might not be that there is too much darkness. Maybe the problem is there is so much light, so easily given that we just don't notice. We take it for granted. Cure our inward blindness, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the sunshine and blue skies. Teach us, Lord, to be grateful in dark clouds and rain. Help us to count our blessings as we so often drink from half-filled glasses. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all who have been affected by the coronavirus. We thank you, Lord, for all medical workers, for all patient parents at home, and for those who live alone. Bring us all together again, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, you care about our physical lives, and you love this material world which you indeed have created. As you walked this earth, you enjoyed food and drink, you laughed, you danced, and you cried. Now, Lord, we know many who laugh and cry, who dance and shed tears, some of these, Lord, we name in silence. Others we name out loud at this time. You may name any person or event in the prayers. Gordon and Marcus, 
all who struggle with disease and grief. Lord, help us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to cry with those who cry. Help us to become helpers for others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Through your mercy, in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And at this time, I invite uh, everyone to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This hour, this day, this coming week, may you sense the presence and power of God's Spirit in your life, and may you notice God's presence where you have never noticed that presence before. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.